Hello and welcome everyone to our webinar today. I'm Sarah Webster here, Knowledge Broker with Niagara Connects. Um, and this event today is hosted by Niagara Connects in partnership with Heart Niagara. Uh, and we're really excited about the topic today. Um, we'll hear a little bit more from Heart Niagara about data and collaboration, research informing a path for solution to preventing heart disease in Niagara. Um, we've got some great presenters today, but I just wanted to do a bit of a technology overview before I pass it off to them. For those of you that are new to our webinar system, um, obviously the audio you're hearing from, from me through the phone line, um, and then the visual is provided in the online meeting room. All of the participant lines are muted during the presentation, and that just helps us cut down on some of the background noise that inevitably happens uh, during these events. So if you have any questions or comments um, during the presentation, please feel free to use the chat pod down the left-hand side of your screen. You can type any questions or comments there, and uh, we'll certainly flag them for the presenters to address at the end of their presentation. Uh, we'll save some, some time for discussion at that point. The presentation is also being recorded. Uh, we record all of our webinars and post them online on the Niagara Knowledge Exchange. And we'll also send out an email within about a week to anyone who's registered for this event with a link to uh, the recording of the presentation today, a PDF of the slides, and uh, additional resources that the presenters will be speaking about today. That's all for me. I'm going to, uh, to stop there, and I'll pass it off to Karen, um, Executive Director from Heart Niagara, to get us started. Karen, over to you. You may have to press star seven to unmute your phone. Or to mute, unmute, yes, your phone. Karen, we can't hear you. If you're speaking, you might still be on mute and have to press star seven to unmute. Can you hear me now? I can hear you now. There you go. Well, so it doesn't matter how many times you practice it, apparently you can still get it backwards. Uh, so welcome, my name's Karen Stern, and uh, I've had a role as the Executive Director at Heart Niagara for 19 years, and I just want to thank everyone for taking the time today to join us. Heart Niagara has joined Niagara Connects to reinforce our relationship with key influencers in the effort to enhance the path to find a solution to preventing heart disease in Niagara. So today we are really going to uh, split the presentation into three areas. Stafford Dobbin is the founder of Heart Niagara, and he'll provide you with an overview of Heart Niagara and how we have arrived 39 years later with programming that reaches more than 10,000 people annually. Don Gibson is our nurse practitioner who's been with Heart Niagara since 2000. And Don will provide you with a review of the Healthy Heart Schools program and how we've continued to build this two-day experiential learning experience uh, program for more than 5,000 students each year in Niagara. And Michael Curry is joining us from SickKids today, and he's representing a team of researchers that Heart Niagara has been working with under the direction of Brian McCrindle since 2008. Mike will be discussing the research publications to date and the impact that made the Made in Niagara solution can have on the landscape of innovative health promotion and health services in Niagara. So take it away, Stafford. Hello, everybody. Um, I just thought uh, we would start by. Um, here we go. Nope, there we don't go. We would start with just a little overview of the origins of this uh, fairly unique organization called Heart Niagara and the reasons why Heart Niagara would choose schools as the pivot for preventing cardiovascular and metabolic disease in adults. So uh, back to uh, the epidemic of heart attack only started in the 1950s, and that was the generation that had first been exposed to adulterated foods after the First World War, to cigarettes, to using motorized transport instead of walking, so that by the 1970s we were having a large number, uh, it was the, the most uh, um, uh, significant disease in the Western world, 60% of heart attack deaths occurred within one hour of the symptoms, chest pain, etc. So the need to get the hospital to the patient became obvious fairly early on rather than waiting for them to go to hospital, ergo the paramedics. 
but paramedics also need citizen cardiopulmonary resuscitation to keep the patient uh, alive if they have a cardiac arrest until the ambulance arrive. And paramedics also need doctors and nurses in emergency rooms that have advanced cardiac life support technique. And it also needs fire police ambulance to be dispatched uh, in an integrated dispatch and a base hospital, which actually we started in Niagara, in Greater Niagara General. The uh, idea of this cardiac ambulance concept actually was started in Belfast, Northern Ireland in the 60s, and I actually worked on it by Professor Frank Pantridge, who had this idea that we get the ambulance to the patient first. So when we were designing Heart Niagara in the late 70s, the uh, original concept and many other places had organizations that supplied cardiopulmonary resuscitation teaching and advanced cardiac life support teaching. But what we decided to do with Heart Niagara was actually make up our, or form a community hub, a community coronary care program that not only supplied a f huge faculty of volunteer CPR teachers and doctors and nurses and paramedics who worked on advanced cardiac life support teaching, but also to uh, build up uh, doctors, nurses, nutritionists, and thera uh, physical therapists to offer cardiac rehabilitation to survivors. And then we also decided to add a tier of primary prevention in workplace, but also in schools. So why would you go into schools back in the 1970s? Because at that time, we realized, uh, first of all, in the Korean and Vietnam War, that very young soldiers autopsied after fatalities already showed very advanced hardening of their cardiac uh, uh, coronary arteries. And that was confirmed by a couple of Bogalusa muscatine heart studies that looked at uh, teenage uh, autopsies on accident deaths and suicides and showed that this hardening of the arteries was very prevalent in certain families and also in people who were smokers or who had elevated levels of cholesterol. So there was a clustering of risk factors in some families more than in others. And of course, the only time that individuals or indeed the whole population of individuals is available to discuss this is when, people, uh, when their children are at school. So the first proposal uh, that we put forward in 1985 was that it would be all grade nine students in the Niagara Peninsula. Grade nine because that was the, first, uh, the last time of mandatory phys ed teaching and we wanted to teach this curriculum through phys ed. The teacher taught the curriculum. Heart Niagara provided a questionnaire to their uh, student and their family on family history and lifestyle and we had a testing day for weight, height, waist, lipid, perhaps cholesterol profile, blood pressure, etc. And a report card was sent to the student, the parent, and their doctor. And basically that is what took place in 1987 when we started this program first. The Niagara Regional Public Health Department, at that time their nurses did a follow-up class, and they also called the at-risk families, although public health has... Uh, not been involved with the program more recently, uh, but they also uh, analyzed the data and uh, later by Bro Brock University did the same thing. But more recently, we have partnered with the Toronto Hospital for Sick Children who have handled the data in the last 10 years. The at-risk families were all sent to their family doctors or pediatricians. And what can we come up with? What can you identify with this intervention? Well, you can find people uh, with positive family histories, even if you're looking at grandparents. And it's interesting that one uh, study, the Utah Health Study, showed that 70% of premature heart attacks occur in 14% of the population that have that positive family history. So it is clustered. We can also let uh, individuals know that their cholesterol levels are elevated that they have elevated waist to height ratios, which in children is the best way of diagnosing early uh, childhood obesity, which will lead to adult obesity. Obviously, we have the questionnaire revealing who's a smoker, 
prematurity, uh, babies born prematurely do have an increased risk of coronary artery disease in later life. And of course, we can also pick up impaired glucose tolerance. So the, uh, referring these families to uh, resources that will make them aware of the risk they run if they take up cigarette smoking or bad nutrition, bad activity habits. But we do believe that individuals should be made aware of the genetic or hereditary risk for premature atherosclerosis and diabetes and obesity that they bring into the world. In other words, people should know what me metabolic baggage they brought with them so that they can make an informed cho choice on whether to smoke or what to eat and how to active to be. And that all, the only way we can start that is in childhood. The disease starts in childhood, and it should be eliminated in childhood. So I'll pass this on to Don, who will go through the nuts and bolts of the program. Thank you. Hi, thanks. Uh, it's Don Gibson, and uh, it's important to note the schools program. It's been around for 30 years, and <clears throat> it's not a short-term project. This is a long-term collaboration between Heart Niagara, the school boards, and researchers. Uh, so, it, you know, it's... Uh, the uh, short-termness of research projects is sometimes a problem with school boards, and uh, we've sort of gotten past that. The uh, uniqueness of the program um, really is the partnership with the school boards over the longevity of the program, uh, the number of grades and the students involved, plus the level of service that we provide. Uh, the health assessment, uh, you can see from that slide, the uh, Cholestec machines are used for uh, point of service care where we're testing their total cholesterols and their HDLs. Uh, we're providing uh, a height and weight, um, the <clears throat> waist circumference, and it's all uh, over the years has been standardized so that every school, every student, uh, we approach it exactly the same way so that uh, the data is um, good. There's an eight-page booklet that goes out to uh, the teachers distribute to the students. Students take it home and they uh, hopefully we'll bring back a parent signature for a consent for the cholesterol testing and fill out the book. And uh, the teachers are uh, incredibly good at uh, um, facilitating that. Um, the suitcases on the side of that slide, uh, that's just all the equipment that we take to the schools every time. There's uh, three to four staff members that uh, uh, go into the phys ed class. Um, the teachers uh, help get it all set up and organized. <coughs> The uh, other part of the program that uh, I always forget to talk about is the CPR part. Um, so the program is run over two days. Uh, one day is the health assessment, and the next day is the CPR. Uh, so they get CPR training uh, along with AED training, and all the schools have AEDs now, so it uh, makes more sense with the kids. The um, um, uh, part of the uh, program uh, is also uh, with all the results, all the data, uh, we put it into a database, uh, is the reporting back uh, to uh, all the partners and the parents. So that's uh, sort of a key aspect of the program. The school board's administration, uh, uh, not rec well, they require a, a, a report back to them about uh, sort of how much involvement we've had with all the schools uh, and sort of what level we're working at. The ethics uh, committees uh, at the schools, uh, we need to communicate with them on any changes in the program and every year uh, for a report. Uh, the phys ed teachers get an annual report, um, but just as important or maybe more important, all the parents get a report on their uh, child's uh, results. Um, the students get a take-home sheet the day of, um, but uh, I think some of those are lost in backpacks and never make it home. Um, so we uh, do the effort of getting a letter home to all the parents and also the health care providers that are identified on the booklets, uh, a letter is also sent to all the uh, uh, families, uh, doctors and nurse practitioners. As you can see on this slide, uh, those letters with uh, yellow um, areas highlighted, um, the database will uh, bring out any con areas of concern. Uh, and hopefully whenever there's high cholesterols or other problems, uh, the family and the uh, physicians or nurse practitioners are able to get together and, and start working on them. 
the uh, data that we've had over the years, uh, we've filtered it out, and this is over several years, um, the obesity rate uh, is about 10% in the 14-year-old age group. Um, that's with a waist circumference, uh, using it as the 90th percentile cutoff point. Uh, the hyperlipidemia, uh, we're looking at non-HDLs and uh, anything greater than 3.75, uh, that's identified as, as a risk. About 5% of the population in that age group uh, are identified. Diabetes, this is self-reported and it's mostly type 1 uh, with the kids reporting it in their uh, booklet. Uh, the f uh, physical inactivity, um, this is reported in the booklet. Um, and we're using the Health Canada guidelines to sort of establish uh, sort of the cutoff levels for that. Tobacco use, this is self-reported again in the booklet, and we also ask every kid directly um, during the height and weight uh, station, um, you know, have they tried smoking, and uh, three or four questions around that, also an e-cigarette question now. The uh, uh, blood pressure, um, we're, we're identifying uh, about 2% of the population in that age group with a greater than 90th percentile. Um, that's, it's hard in the schools, uh, the kids, who knows what's just been going on with the kid and, and uh, have they just been running around uh, or racing to school, that sort of thing. So uh, that's not a high number, but it is significant in that age group, um, but it always needs to be rechecked with the uh, healthcare provider. Uh, family history is uh, a key aspect and we're identifying uh, about 5% of the population in that group that have a mom uh, less than 65 or a dad less than 55 with a, a positive family history already. The 14-year-olds uh, in last last year's data, uh, it showed about 42% uh, of them had at least one risk factor. 11% uh, of them had two risk factors. 2.9% had about three risk factors. 0.7% uh, had four risk factors, and there was actually some of the kids had um, five risk factors already. In that uh, data, they, we don't include physical inactivity. Um, the numbers would go a lot higher if we did. Um, but uh, I, th I think our, our uh, research tools need to be a bit improved before we can um, start seeing a lot in that. The, uh, uh, <coughs> over the years, um, I lost my page here. Uh, the value added, so um, every year uh, all the kids are getting a certificate for their CPR, so they're not um, paying for that. That's a, It's a free CPR uh, certificate and training, um, plus all the uh, health assessment, uh, all the data management, the letter mailing, all that sort of stuff. Um, we're adding, you know, about $358,000 into uh, the schools uh, and the students' uh, support. That includes the grade uh, 7, 9, and 11 uh, for last year. Um, we saw um, uh, over 4,000 kids uh, for both levels of, of service. The program is the largest and uh, longest running study of child and uh, youth cardiovascular risk issues uh, that we can identify uh, anywhere uh, in North America or even in Europe. Um, it's been going since 1985 and it still is an ongoing. Uh, our, when you sit down and do the numbers, the total value added to this uh, population and the schools is, you know, well over four million dollars and uh, that involves the grade five, seven, and nine, and eleven uh, uh, classes. We've done some pilot uh, projects in grade five to see uh, if we can uh, take this back to that level um, and do identically what we do in grade nine with the grade fives. And both pilots were very successful. Now we're just uh, hoping to get uh, some research funding where we can go into, into it and do a, a larger project. So over the years, we've seen over 80,000 uh, kids in the CPR training and over 75,000 kids uh, doing uh, cardiovascular risk assessments. In all those years, uh, 39 studies uh, have been uh, published utilizing uh, Healthy Heart uh, Schools program data. And Heart Niagara uh, is the main contributor to supporting all of the uh, services within that program. Uh, so you can pretty much 
say that Heart Niagara is the major funder for uh, preventative research uh, in Niagara. The uh, fishbone, that's, that's an example of all the different uh, uh, articles that have been published in journals. Uh, it also uh, includes uh, um, presentations at uh, uh, conferences and uh, other abstracts that have been published. And that's um, good. Michael, do you want to carry on? So, um, so this is Michael Curry here calling in uh, on behalf of Sick Kids, um, and uh, it's an honor to be able to speak uh, about the uh, collaboration and partnership between Heart Niagara and the Hospital for Sick Children. Um, uh, on behalf of the Sick Kids team and, and uh, Dr. Brian McCrindle, who had initially, uh, who's the, the leader from the Sick Kids team side uh, in terms of the uh, in terms of this collaboration, um, the uh, the the point of the next few minutes will be to just provide a uh, overview of the scope of the problem from an academic point of view and a research point of view. Um, and highlight some of the work we've done with uh, Heart Niagara and thanks to Heart Niagara and their unique setup, uh, and then also touch on some of the media exposure and the next steps that we plan on taking as well. So uh, as, as has already been mentioned by Dr. Dobbin and, and Don, um, the uh, Healthy Arts Schools program has been operating continuously for nearly 30 years, and, and it provides a really comprehensive assessment of cardiometabolic risk uh, which is basically cardiovascular risk, uh, as well as risk for things like diabetes and, and obesity. Um, they provide good assessments of family history uh, and lifestyle behaviors as well. Uh, and they're really uniquely positioned to answer these questions, and, and Don did a great job of uh, showing the logistics of how they answer these questions and uh, being in a position where universal screening can take place in an entire community is really unprecedented as far as I know across the country. Uh, and, and it's very rare across um, North America in general. So there's a strong existing partnership and it's been consistent on an annual basis. Uh, and as a result, there's established universal screening and education uh, for all the students in the Niagara region, both in the Catholic schools and the public schools. Uh, this has yielded numerous scientific publications, and not just any scientific publications, but publications in high-impact journals. And I think this speaks to the uniqueness of this collaboration and the types of questions it can uh, answer. And as a result of landing in high-impact journals and high-impact conferences, uh, this has resulted in significant media attention uh, as well that I'll touch on. Uh, so overall, this is the ideal opportunity to assess the heart health of children and not only assess the heart health of these children, but also the impact of screening, and, and that will really be the next steps that we want to take. So what, what's the problem that we're trying to address? And, and Dr. Dalvin assessed this or, or mentioned this initially. And really the problem comes down for from our standpoint comes down to cardiovascular disease. And cardiovascular disease um, is primarily the result of atherosclerosis, which is the plaque development that builds in arteries. And those plaques are what results of, over time in heart attacks and strokes. Now, there's risk factors for the development of these plaques. And some of these risk factors are modifiable or reversible uh, foreseeably, and some of them are non-reversible or non-modifiable. So some of the modifiable ones include obesity, blood pressure problems, lipid problems, and some of the non-modifiable problems include uh, family history or socioeconomic status in some cases may not be modifiable, and in some cases it is modifiable. And so uh, the most important thing that's developed over the last uh, one to two decades is the identification that these risk factors and actually the plaque development themselves begins in childhood. Uh, and that was identified through the autopsy studies that Dr. Dobbin mentioned and then through non-invasive studies as well. And so therefore, the early identification of children at risk may help reduce the disease burden that we see in adulthood. So kids are very uniquely positioned for early risk reduction, uh, but it's a challenging population because these are risk factors that you can't really see other than obesity itself. Um, so you have to test for them. 
and uh, what better time to test them during school time when you know that you have all of them available. So uh, I want to just briefly now touch on some of the studies we've undertaken in our partnership with Heart Niagara. Um, so I'll, I'll touch on the initial studies that looked at population trends, then looked at some measures including the waist to height ratio, uh, which we've helped popularize, um, and then some studies that were done on sleep, exercise, family history, uh, and, and risk factor clustering, and then finally a study that we're currently finishing up on e-cigarettes. So the initial study done in the partnership with Sick Kids was carried out by Dr. McCrindo, and it basically identified the problem. Um, and so it looked at the population trends in the Niagara community um, over the course from 2002 to 2008, and it was published in the Journal of Pediatrics, which is one of the more high-impact pediatric journals. Um, and so it noticed that over time there was an increased proportion of obese adolescents between 2002 and 2008. Uh, and then there was also an increasing proportion of adolescents who had lipid problems as well. Uh, and, uh, and then overall, when they, when they used a, a marker or, or assessed all the various levels of cardiovascular risk, they noticed that this was also increasing in proportion as well. This is just a glimpse of the study, obviously. It, it went into more detail. Um, but this study showed that uh, we were able to actually identify uh, in an academic setting that there were significant problems in this seemingly healthy community that, that likely represents many communities across the country. Um, so it was sort of the starting point. Uh, the next study that was done uh, looked at the physical activity uh, levels and, and the impact on cardiovascular risk in, in both normal weight children and obese children. And this was carried out by Laura Banks under the supervision of Brian McCrindle. Laura Banks is, uh, is an exercise physiologist that was at Sick Kids at the time. And so they found that, um, that obviously, or, or had, which had been shown before, that obesity in students was associated with a worsened lipid profile. Uh, but curiously, they noticed that the more exercise that obese adolescents did, they found that those adolescents had a higher odds of having an abnormal blood pressure. Um, but that being said, the more muscular adolescents, uh, who exercised frequently had a lower odds of having an abnormal blood pressure. So this study sort of raised the questions as to whether or not um, there was a, a way to differentiate um, sort of the healthy obese, quote-unquote healthy obese, from the non-healthy obese adolescents, and could this help the clinician in uh, further guiding uh, adolescents as to cardiovascular risk reduction techniques and, and how much exercise they should be doing. So uh, the next study carried out with Heart and Hager was a study that I, I had the uh, pleasure of carrying out uh, with uh, Dr. McCrindle uh, and the whole Heart Niagara team. And through this study, we really wanted to identify whether or not there were other measures, specifically measures of waist circumference, uh, that we could use to help further stratify these kids. So to help identify, are there a quote-unquote healthy, obese, an overweight population versus a non-healthy or at-risk obese and overweight population. And uh, so one of the things we wanted to look at was the waist-to-height ratio, which is just, which is exactly as it sounds. It's taking the waist circumference and dividing it by the height. And we found that when we divided adolescents up by BMI uh, into uh, normal BMI, overweight, and obese, uh, then if we further divided them in these subgroups by their waist-to-height ratio, we found that as the waist-to-height ratio increased in each group, we saw a worsening cardiovascular profile. And so the waist-to-height ratio may actually help differentiate these at-risk individuals from healthy, overweight, and obese individuals. And these are a couple of figures to help uh, convey this point. So at the top left, uh, we see a bar graph where on the bottom we see that they, we've divided the adolescents based on normal BMI, overweight, and obese BMIs. And then on the uh, vertical axis, we're looking at the non-HDL cholesterol levels, which is quote-unquote bad cholesterol. And we can see in the overweight and the obese groups, uh, the, darkened, the darker colors correspond to an increasing waist-to-height ratio. And so within the obese group uh, and the overweight group, we can see as the waist-to-height ratio increases, the bad cholesterol levels also increase. Uh, and this was quite a significant finding. 
And, uh, and actually, in the obese and overweight groups that had normal waist-to-height ratios, they had cholesterol levels that were approaching those of kids with normal BMIs. And then correspondingly, in the bottom figure, we see that for good cholesterol, uh, the cholesterol levels decrease uh, as the waist-to-height ratio increases, and this was pretty marked in the obese group. Uh, the cartoon on the right side just uh, conveys this message uh, more clearly, and, and it basically shows one of the key flaws for body mass index, um, which is that body mass index is just a measure of how much you weigh divided by the square of how much of what your height is. So uh, not all mass is equal. And so you can see the bodybuilder on the left and the gentleman on the right uh, both have the same height and both have the same weight, and therefore they have the same BMI. Uh, but it's obvious that the cardiovascular risk profile is probably different uh, between these two individuals. And, um, and so then the takeaway from this, and, and what we had found was that a, a normal waist-to-height ratio, or one that you should aim for, is 0.5. And really what we mean by that is you should keep your waist circumference less than half your height. This is a really easy measure, and it turns out from other studies that it, it crosses from children into adulthood and across genders and ethnicities as well. So it's something that the clinicians can use to advocate to their patients, and it's far easier to understand than BMI. Um, and, uh, and I thought this was pretty funny. This is, this is from the movie Twins uh, that starred Arnold Schwarzenegger and Danny DeVito. And so, yeah, these two may be twins as far as BMI is concerned, but probably not by their waist-to-height ratio. Um, and uh, so you can see that uh, Arnold's estimated waist-to-height ratio is 0.47, which is normal and great, and whereas Danny DeVito's is uh, probably closer to 0.71, which is elevated, even though they have about the same BMI. So then uh, a study was done uh, that was published in the Canadian Medical Association Journal uh, looking at sleep disturbance and cardiovascular risk in adolescents. Um, and this was carried out by Dr. Indra Narang at SickKids, who's a, the sleep specialist and in charge of the sleep lab at SickKids. She found on average that students were sleeping about eight hours a night on weeknights and, more, and, and sleeping in more on weekends, which is not really a surprise to any of us. However, they found that a higher sleep disturbance score was associated with greater cardiovascular risk and higher blood pressure and lipid values, uh, as well as sleep disturbance was associated with cardiovascular risk factors themselves. Uh, just recently, in the last couple of months, we published a paper uh, looking at the impact of screening for cardiovascular risk in these adolescents on the identification of high-risk families. And, and uh, Dr. Dobbin and Don had touched on this briefly as well. And so we found, so, so the importance of this problem is that young adults or, or parents of these children, they statistically have the lowest healthcare utilization, so they don't frequent a physician unless there's something wrong. And so then we may be actually missing and, and, and having a delayed identification and management of cardiovascular risk factors and disease. So, and recent guidelines have recommended universal lipid screening in children. So therefore, screening these kids may actually help identify at-risk family members. And we found just that. So these are two figures from the study, and they essentially show that when you find lipid problems, which is in the top figure, or you find an abnormal waist-to-height ratio in the bottom figure, then this increases the odds that you'll find uh, family history of diabetes uh, in, in first and second degree family members and lipid problems as well. Uh, and so, this really ident or, or, or touches on the concept of reverse cascade screening, which is that we may be able to potentially identify family members who seemingly didn't have any problems or have hidden and, and silent problems. And we may be able to do that through the Heart Healthy Heart Schools program screening. So if you find a kid that has an abnormal risk profile, then we may be able to then reach out to the first and second degree family members and begin screening them and then using those uh, as new index cases to screen further family members and help identify as many cases as possible before they actually present with a heart attack or before they actually present with a stroke. And the uh, Heart Niagara Schools program is, is very well positioned to do this. Finally, I wanted to touch on our most recent study, which we're very excited about looking at e-cigarette use. Uh, this is a very hot topic these days, and, and really not much is known about it or its use in Canada, and specifically the motivations for its use in Canada. 
and uh, the Healthy Heart Schools program assesses this in kids, and so we wanted to take advantage of this and, and share with the country and the world uh, what a typical population of adolescents is doing in terms of e-cigarettes. And we found that uh, about 10 uh, to 11 percent of grade 9 kids had used e-cigarettes, um, and uh, notably, almost three-quarters of them used them because they were cool or fun or new, uh, whereas most of them didn't use them as a smoking cessation device. And though this may seem like it, what we would expect, it's important to identify because these, this is what they are marketed for, when really they may be gateways towards smoking and they may be renormalizing smoking behaviors after public health and physicians and, and individuals alike have done extensive work to discourage smoking behaviors, and they've become less cool with time, but e-cigarettes have managed to bring them back to the forefront uh, using uh, flavors like cotton candy and uh, cola and things that are clearly targeted towards a younger population. And in this figure, we, we see risk factors for using e-cigarettes, and, and basically the biggest risk factor for using e-cigarettes was being in a home that has family members that smoke, having friends that smoke, uh, smoking themselves in the last 30 days, or using other tobacco devices like a, a water pipe or otherwise known as a shisha or a hookah, and also using cigarellos as well. And so all this work has gotten a lot of media attention uh, from prominent news sites like CBC, uh, the Globe and Mail, uh, and then American sites as well as the, Blo the Boston Globe, uh, NBC News. Um, and, uh, and, and, other, and, and so on and so forth, as well as uh, radio uh, programs on CBC Morning. Um, and so our goal has been to try to spread this as much as possible, both within the academic community at all the conferences that we feel would be beneficial, but also in the media as well. Um, so the next steps, and, and so all this has been done with funding that is essentially being provided uh, by the Heart Niagara group themselves and through their hard work and, and, uh, and through philanthropic contributions as well. Um, but really, of all the sustainable portions, this is probably the least sustainable, which is the funding. And, and so uh, all this has been done with, uh, with scraping through funding, and, and uh, as far as I understand, and, and it, one can only imagine what we could accomplish um, if we had a set, steady stream of uh, funding coming in. Um, so the next steps we plan on, and we have some grant money to try this out, is, is expanding the program and looking at the follow-up data, uh, specifically seeing what happens after we identify these students and seeing what happens in the family physician's office as well as in the home. Do they change their behavior? Do the family physicians and, and the primary care practitioners uh, meet with uh, the individuals who are at increased risk? Do they carry out further tests? Do they initiate medications or referrals and whatnot? These are questions that we don't have a strong idea of yet. Also, we, the Heart Niagara Group hopes to expand into the grade five and seven programs in, in uh, uh, more detail and, and with the consistency and excellence that they have done with the grade nine program. Uh, and this will help also uh, uh, match what current guidelines are suggesting as well. Um, and so these are really the next steps we look forward to. So in conclusion, the Heart Niagara group is uniquely positioned to have a significant and long-lasting effect on the cardiovascular and overall health of children through high yield and important clinical research. And the ongoing funding will help ensure its sustainability and allow for this expansion. And Heart Niagara can serve as a model for similar programs and expansion at a local, provincial, and, na and national level. Uh, so that, that's it for my part. Hi, so uh, thank you, um, Mike, that was great. Uh, it's Karen back just to say uh, we've demonstrated, we think here, that Heart Niagara has found innovative ways to increase and maximize our efforts and impact here in Niagara. We annually reach all 12 municipalities. We're in 29 secondary schools, 154 elementary schools, and more than 450 work sites. So we've leveraged that commitment we made in 1977 around community preparedness, and we've turned it into a major force in Niagara, investing uh, Niagara money all the way through. So for us, uh, we want to do more, and we want to do more with you. And so that only happens with all of you participating on this journey. And today we showcase the work we've done 
and the level of service we can provide. But that success is really based on all of us doing it together and leaving the path better than we found it. So our goal today was to share a success with you and invite you to work with Heart Niagara and leverage each of our opportunities we have. In Niagara, we are 450,000 plus voices and we need to be one. We need to speak with one voice to increase system funding, research opportunities and programs to improve the health outcomes of Niagarans. So thank you. Great, thank you, Karen. We'll open it up now um, for some questions from participants on the line. I do see that a few have already come through, so please feel free to use the chat pod down the left-hand side of your screen. Um, or you can unmute your individual line if you'd like to, to verbally ask the question by pressing star seven. Um, Jason had asked, and I think uh, it was just clarified by Mike at the end there, but um, what grade was for the testing? I think uh, Donna talked about it being grade nine, is that correct? Uh, yes, that's correct. Perfect. Yeah, that's correct. It's mostly in grade nine. We see uh, grade sevens. Um, the only thing we don't do in grade seven that we do in grade nine is the cholesterol test. Uh, we do everything else, the, the booklet, the blood pressures, and the height and weight and waist circumference. The grade fives we've done for <clears throat> a couple of projects in a couple of different years, but uh, those were just pilot projects. Grade 11s, we see a few grade 11s uh, every year, um, but it's mainly the grade nine is is the bulk of the numbers. Okay. That's all okay. Um, and Sabrina asks, is the program offered in French language schools? And if so, is the program itself provided in French? Uh, the program, we do the program in um, uh, Jean Vanier out in Welland, uh, but uh, we've never been able to um, provide it in French. It would be great if we could, however, uh, we have limits. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I do see that uh, Sarah J, our chairperson on the line, has also provided a link for participants to um, the school's program on the Heart Niagara website, um, as well as a link to Heart Niagara's publication list. Are there any uh, other questions? Oh, here we go. Jason has just asked, um, was done by fasting blood? No, that's not possible at school. So the timing in the school is dependent on uh, what time the uh, phys ed classes are. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's just a way to be able to get kids uh, fasting. I, I would also add to that that fortunately a few recent studies uh, that uh, were done in the States showed that uh, non-fasting lipid assessments are, are almost equal or are equal to fasting assessments in terms of identifying kids at risk. But we would hope that the kids that are identified at risk would then get subsequent fasting evaluations through their primary care physician. Right. Perfect. Um, Doug has asked, are you able to track outcomes to those students that you identify at risk? Good question. So uh, that, that's really what the next step is that we'd like to uh, establish with the, the Heart Niagara Group and, and establish a system where we can track these outcomes. Currently, as uh, Dr. Dobbin and Don mentioned, when kids have an abnormal screening profile, uh, they, this is flagged for them, their family, and for the physician, and a letter is sent to all three. Um, but we don't have a strong sense yet as to what happens uh, with those values, and, and that, that's just a, um, a, a funding and logistics issue. Uh, but we recently did receive grant money through Sick Kids to uh, pilot this and, and to uh, follow up uh, students over the course of one to two academic school years uh, and to see what happens when they have abnormal values. Mm. Great. Mary has asked, how can data uh, gather... Could I, just, oh. could I come in on that? Absolutely, yep. Hi, Doug. Uh, Doug Monkley asked that question. He also was actually the guy that uh, implemented the paramedics back in the late 70s, early 80s, so it's nice to have you on board. Um, the, one of the problems with the tracking the outcomes um, is that, the first of all, when, when public health were calling the those families at high risk, the response uh, to go to the family doctor and have it followed up on was extremely good. Uh, 
since public health has stopped doing that, um, the family doctors are a little bit left um, in doubt as to how to handle some of these situations, which are very complicated and require a lot of motivational counselling, uh, follow-up, etc. So what we're really working on at the moment is trying to get a central agency that is in fact Heart Niagara, that all the family doctors and pediatricians can refer high-risk factor families into, much like the cardiac rehab program for people who've survived heart attacks, then we refer them into a similar program for people who are at high risk. So that's in, in place at the moment, but it does require getting all the family uh, physicians uh, in the peninsula, nurse practitioners, pediatricians, etc., on the same uh, track, and that is a big task, but we're <laughs> going to try it. Absolutely. And uh, kind of in follow-up to, to this line, then, Jason has asked, um, are these identified kids followed up? So if, if they are followed up in the future, what measures would be uh, for them? So they're, so they're, they're currently not followed up, as, as we just touched on. Um, well, it looks like he removed the question. Uh, but, but the measures we would follow up is, is did they confirm uh, the presence of lipid problems with fasting levels? And did they com- or did they confirm the presence of blood pressure problems? Um, did, what sort of management was initiated? So was there lifestyle and, and uh, diet and, and exercise counseling that was provided? And for kids that needed it, did they refer them to a lipid specialist or, or a, a specialist in whatever area of cardiovascular risk that they had abnormal? Um, so that's what we would look at. And then subsequent values. And so was there any correction or change over the next six months to 12 months? Okay. Um, um, Mary? Can I just, sorry. Mm-hmm. Yep. Um, yes, and I, I, I think the, you know, the trouble is it's very expensive to try and put follow-up, longitudinal follow-up studies together, but we have a very large number of anecdotal um, episodes in families throughout family physicians in the uh, Niagara region where families have made significant uh, changes based on the information that they received from this program um, <clears throat> in uh, weight loss, in uh, uh, going on medication, actually, in some uh, cases. So, uh, I mean, the opportunity to uh, get more and more people, uh, because there is, of course, a tipping effect. Once you start getting people aware of the fact that they are able to make changes, they will tell other people, and you eventually you might get the food manufacturers to start making foods that are non-atherogenic uh, rather than the present situation, which is really a nightmare because the food industry is so uh, heart unhealthy. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mary has asked, how can data gathered by Heart Niagara inform the work of the Healthy Kids Challenge in Niagara? Uh, hi. Um, so as far as the Healthy Kids Community Challenge, I think in theme one, it is around physical activity. So we have uh, baseline data on over uh, 10,000 kids over the last five years and their uh, self-reported physical activity. We have another uh, report that can help inform what kids are doing in grade five. We have another 2,000 kids in that data. So we certainly are working with the Healthy Kids Community Challenge uh, to look at ways to leverage uh, the experience that we have and the knowledge we have about how to help kids move forward quicker. Wonderful. Thank you. Any other verbal questions that uh, participants would like to ask? You can unmute your individual line by pressing star seven. As I'm waiting for that, I'm just going to put up the, the last slide with contact information. People have a chance to grab that. Okay. Thank you, Jason. Jason asks, what are the requirements of access to that data that you just spoke about, Karen? Uh, So that's interesting, um, Jason. Certainly that is an area that uh, we talk about often because uh, we would like to be as open and transparent as possible. We also want to make sure that the partners we do have 
um, are honored uh, through their contribution over the last uh, 20 years of data. So we do have data agreements in place with other organizations, and we work directly with sick kids to make sure that we're sending out consistent uh, information and one that supports each other's work. So we would be happy to entertain any conversations, and we would work together as a group to build a data agreement and move forward. Very cool. Um, and as a follow-up, Jason had asked where to get this information. So that would be a contact with you then, Karen? Uh, absolutely. Uh, feel free to uh, uh, email me, and then I can put you in touch with our whole group. And we can either do a conference call with any partners uh, considering worth looking at the data and the question that you may have for some research. And I would like to add that um, we do look at updating the booklet over uh, each two years. So if there is some specific research that you're interested in the community, uh, there is a, a group of questions that we've floated in and out over the years, which gives us an opportunity to ask some unique questions if you're looking at a specific research project. But of mm -hmm. course, there is always uh, some financial obligation attached to those kinds of things. Very interesting opportunities for partnership, though. For sure. Uh, that's how Hartnegger has actually been able to stay in business this year is because of the generosity of the community and the key influencers here in Niagara that have made a difference. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you so much to our presenters today um, for sharing this information and uh, to our participants on the line for, uh, for engaging and asking some really great questions. As I said, we'll send out a resource package within about a week with links to, uh, to some of the material talked about today, um, as well as a recording of the presentation and a PDF of these slides as well. Um, but if you have any questions in the meantime, uh, the presenter's uh, email addresses are up there on the screen, um, as well as our contact information for Niagara Connect. Um, our next webinar with Niagara Connect will take place on March the 9th. I had to think about that for a minute. Um, and that'll be about the mental health uh, and addictions access line in Niagara. Um, so if you haven't already done so, I do encourage you uh, to check that out as well and sign up for that. Other than that, when we close the meeting room, you will be re redirected to uh, just a couple short evaluation questions to help us continue to improve um, this webinar series that we offer. Uh, but uh, other than that, please don't hesitate to reach out at any time to our network. Thanks so much, everyone, and have a great afternoon. Thanks Take to Niagara Connects. Thank you. Bye.